Uh, okay, so uh, let's begin with this uh, panel. Welcome back to all the assistants and of course the uh, our presenters uh, today. We are in room two in this panel on conflict resolution and reconciliation. Um, first, we're going to hear the presentation of Dr. Tatsushi Arai, his associate professor of Peace and Conflict Studies from Kent State uh, University. And he will talk about functional coexistence in conflict affected societies. So uh, you have half an hour, and then we will pass the word to Dr. Tamishni Dane. And by the end of our time, we will have uh, 10 minutes for QA. So I ask all the attendees to write down your comments and your questions using the Q&A button we have here on Zoom. And pretty much that will be it. Thank you so much for joining us. And I give you the word, uh, Dr. Tatsushi. Yeah. Thank you very much. Let me... Before maybe I, I share the slides, I would say just a few words. Hello, everyone. As uh, Mauricio said, uh, my name is Tatsushi Arai. I'm an associate professor of peace and conflict studies at Kent State University in Ohio, USA. And before we begin, uh, I should make two points explicit. Uh, number one is that I am a professor and researcher, but I'm also a um, practitioner of peace building. And number two is that I'm aware that, that the broader discipline in which this conference is taking place is international criminology. And my approach to challenges of criminology comes from the field of peace and conflict studies. So I'll be referring to insights uh, from that perspective. I'd like to just share a couple of um, slides to start with. Mauricio, do you see what's on the screen? Uh, yes, we got your first slide. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so as I mentioned, before I get into the discussion on functional coexistence, I wanted to just run through a little bit of a visual images of my work as a practitioner. Uh, I work as a mediator, dialogue facilitator, a supporter for a system design in peace building, a mentor, advisor, both at the civil society level and at a government um, and, and international level as well. So this, for example, is one of the, the seminars on East Asia in Washington, DC. I've been actively engaged in Pakistan and Afghanistan at the civil society level. Um, I spent three years in Northeastern Nigeria uh, working with uh, the communities affected by Boko Haram's insurgency and uh, military's counterinsurgency campaigns. In, and I spent uh, five years in Lebanese uh, Syrian context during civil war to support uh, civil society, humanitarian professionals, as well as uh, people from the government institutions in Syria. And I mentioned these um, personal episodes partly because the theme of my presentation comes from the last 25 years of my practitioner experience. The topic of my presentation, as Mauricio mentioned, is functional coexistence in conflict affected societies, a decades long view of conflict non-resolution. And this is a working title for a book I'm working on now. The point of departure in my inquiry is that the focus and significance of our field, peace and conflict studies, as it informs international criminology. And I see that there are at least two uh, contending views uh, broadly defined of how in conflict issues are looked at. 
one, one approach is to seek common ground between contending parties for a potential of resolution. And the second approach is to stay constructively engaged in an enduring state of conflict non-resolution. So to illustrate this contrast, I am presenting two pictures, each from the Rakhine state, which is a Western coastal area of Myanmar or Burma, in which I've been engaged now for 10 years. Uh, some of you might have heard of the Rohingya Muslim community a minority that is stateless, living in the midst of the Rakhine as well as Burmese, many Buddhist majority society. And if you follow the first approach, seeking common ground, you can have two concentric circles as you see on the screen. And perhaps try to find common ground there. And if you choose not to see common ground, partly because it is too offensive or too, too premature, say for the Rohingya community members or their perceived opponents, the Rakhine Buddhist majority society, uh, you choose not to have concentric circles such as this. And here, um, to elucidate the, the, the challenge in this uh, tension between the two basic approaches to conflict, I want to introduce the concept of enduring conflict. Uh, I define enduring conflict uh, following Bernard Meyer as follows. It is that aspect of a dispute that is embedded in structures, systems, values, or identity will therefore not be resolved through short-term resolution-oriented conflict interventions. Enduring conflict is long-lasting because of its nature, not because of ineffective or inappropriate efforts to resolve it. Until the roots of the conflict change, the system evolves or the identity or value-based elements are profoundly transformed. The conflict will remain, although how it manifested may vary over time. And the, the easiest way to illustrate enduring conflict is to think of interpersonal challenges. I used to have a neighbor who is a young couple in their twenties who got divorced while they have a one-year-old child. They fiercely dispute, disputed who has a child custody. And if I think of what a so resolution to this conflict would look like, I have to be puzzled. Although they may change their perceptions about the child custody dispute, it is most likely that the conflict is not going to be resolved due to the very nature of it, as this working definition says. Perhaps when this child becomes 21 years old, 30 years old, one day for a Christmas or Thanksgiving or whatever the family gathering occasion may be, those people now are over 30 years old would look back at the 30 years of dispute and be able to put that into perspective. But that kind of way of thinking is different than seeking a resolution, let us let alone settlement. So I hope this um, illustration of interpersonal conflict, deep rooted in a structure of the family and identity issues would illustrate what we mean by an enduring conflict, distinguished from some other conflicts that can be resolved. So to get to more of the conceptual aspect of my presentation, I need to define what I mean by functional coexistence. By functional coexistence, I am referring to the intersection of enduring negative peace. Negative peace means the absence of physical violence, physical fighting, 
on the one hand, and a state of mutual denial or mutual non-recognition. In other words, functional coexistence is a sustainable piece in an enduring interactive conflict with seemingly existential characteristics. Now, when I say mutual denial or non-recognition, it requires precision, a fine tuning of the concept. Because what, we, what are we going to deny? What are we going to choose not to recognize? So at the state level or international level, we can deny the state food, we can deny the government, we can den deny an existing regime, we can deny a, a signature policy of a certain polity, or we can simply deny a very uh, strong, long-lasting position. I'm not going to go to some specific examples of that. So when I say denial, non-recognition associated with the notion of existential characteristics, I am defining this idea very broadly. And before I go to elaborate on this, I just want to draw people's attention to the fact that, think about it, this is a paradox. Because if there is a semblance of stability due to the absence of non-fighting, then there, there could be a push for harmony. But this working definition says, on the other hand, there is an active move for mutual denial and non-recognition. Those two elements usually don't come together. That's why functional coexistence sits in a paradox of the two uh, forces, which may not come together so easily. Having said that, in International con in international context, we today have a lot of different ex examples of functional coexistence. So I'll be citing some of the examples which are illustrative of the working definition of functional coexistence and some additional examples whereby a functional coexistence there is potentially potentially applicable at some point in the future. So examples include Northern Ireland, Bosnia-Herzegovina, the divided island of Cyprus, potentially, if and when there is a ceasefire and semblance of a political process that emerges at some point, Russia-Ukraine-NATO relationship may be more relevant to a functional coexistence than to a typical peace process, let alone reconciliation, because of the depth of the enmity and the destruction. North and South Korea relations and their relationship to USA falls under the category of functional coexistence. Afghanistan's Taliban in relation to Washington, D.C., could be seen as an example of functional coexistence. Uh, Syria, with respect to, to the, the Kurds and Arab relations, as well as the opposition and the Assad regime, could be seen as a sign of functional coexistence, or lack thereof. Uh, Israel-Palestine uh, relations could become relevant in the future as potential example of functional coexistence. Rohingya Rakhine Burma relations, as I mentioned, can be a case study of functional coexistence in the future because of the depth of the division. India, Pakistan over Kashmir could potentially become um, subject of functional coexistence. Italicized cases are the ones I personally uh, work in. So I hope that the uh, participants get a sense of the context where functional coexistence is applicable. From here, for the rest of the presentation, I'll be talking about a concrete empirical example of functional coexistence and unpack what is happening in at least one concrete example. Then secondly, I would turn my attention to the kind of concrete social action and so-called conflict intervention 
that is informed by a co functional coexistence theory. So the example I pick, I said case study too, because in the article that is open uh, access that's available uh, online under the same type of functional coexistence has um, two case studies. The one is East and West German relations from the historical context. The second case study comes from Taiwan, China, US relations. Uh, where I have been engaged now for two decades in civil society dialogue as a dialogue facilitator. Now, what you see on the screen is a typical Cartesian space, X and Y. On the X axis, uh, you have a range between more individual and more collective. What that means is that closer to the origin of this Cartesian space, the more individual-based human interactions become. The farther away from the origin, the more collective or group-based the interactions will become. On the y-axis, you have a range between more informal, closer to the origin, more formal, which is far away from the origin. By more informal, I am talking about unscripted, unscripted, less institutionalized interactions. In other words, if the government gives people to do uh, to, to pursue a mandate and interactions follow that mandate, those interactions would belong to more formal uh, level. But if particular individuals interacting on their own accord, on their volition, they can belong more to the more informal level. So in this XY space, you see the whole range of interactions taking place. And for example, a Taiwan Strait conflict has been ongoing since the late 1940s when the People's Republic of China was established to the point that the two million uh, Kuomintang, uh, the Chinese nationalists, so to speak, fled the Taiwan Strait to begin to reside on the Taiwan islands. And that became the beginning of a physical separation between the two sides. But as late as 1992, the two sides, through the cumulative exchanges of a semi-official memorandum, came to an understanding called um, 1992 consensus, which meant that Taipei and Beijing came to a loosely shared understanding that the two sides belong to one China. But this understanding is disputed uh, for various interpretations. I don't get into details as to how that is disputed. What's important is that the following year in 1993 in Singapore, as you see in the red um, indication here, the two sides uh, functionaries met for the first time for a technical exchange, despite the enduring reality of mutual denial and non-recognition. To be more precise, it is the Beijing side that denies Republic of China, that is based in Taiwan, but the denial or no recognition is still there. But a point about the second item I indicated on this Cartesian space, the free trade agreement, 2021, is that despite the status of no recognition and denial, the two sides agreed in principle to lower the trade barriers and in 2015, um, Xi Jinping from a mainland China, China, Chinese side, and Ma Yingzhou, then Taiwanese president, at the first ever summit, all of this within the context of mutual denial. Now, I need to hasten to emphasize that as of 2023, cross trade relations, Taiwan China relations, will be most critical and most dangerous by all measures, security, political, and otherwise. But still, the two sides within the framework of mutual denial and struggle 
uh, to maintain a semblance of functional coexistence. You notice that in about, just above this Cartesian space, I, en emphasize, I, I, I indicated shifting boundaries of mutual non-recognition. What I mean is that from mutual visits of tourists across the Taiwan Strait, starting in 2008, to the kinds of civil society dialogues across the Taiwan Strait that I have been co-facilitating for over two decades, close to two decades now, civil society dialogues, to the administrative meetings that started taking place in 1993, to a de facto free trade agreement, to the Taiwan-China summit, as you see in the picture. All these dynamic shifts and movements have taken place within the same unchanging premise of non-recognition. And so I call these shifting boundaries through history, shifting boundaries of mutual non-recognition. Why is the awareness of shifting boundaries important? It is important because uh, this, this work I'm doing is to look squarely at conflict non-resolution, not so much of resolution to be clear. And when we have an enduring state of non-resolution, people give up. The governments no longer take affirmative and proactive policy to try to do something about it. Funders would withdraw from any form of investment because it doesn't make sense to keep investing in things which don't get resolved. And so here, uh, if those elastic boundaries of mutual non-recognition actually shifting, then my question is, is there any way we can take a decades long view, generational view of those shifting boundaries without giving up with the false and bigger understanding that things are completely stuck. In fact, in many contexts of functional coexistence, things are not stuck. They are moving quite dynamically, except that they are confined to the fundamental framework of negative peace, non-fighting on the one hand, and the premise of mutual non-recognition. So from here, I'm gonna shift gears to think about how to apply that this understanding or theory of functional coexistence to proactive steps in um, conflict resolution practitioners, policy makers, and self-conscious conflict parties who seek change, and how do they apply uh, these kinds of uh, awareness to concrete action? And I'm going to just make uh, three, basically three points. Number one is to ask, how can these actors build on functional coexistence as a basis for a long-term systemic conflict intervention? The proposal I'm putting forward in my publications is to distinguish between short-term action and projects on the one hand, and long-term processes and patterns. Because the context I'm referring to are by definition confined by mutual non-recognition, active denial. There is no such thing as a, as a long-term planning for change that's possible. There are no underlying conditions for that to happen, looking at the Taiwan Strait and potentially uh, Russia-Ukraine situations. But even under those circumstances, there are always some concrete actions and projects. So for instance, in the Taiwan Strait diagram, you saw the trade agreements are possible, technical exchanges through Singapore and through a, um, the third, uh, you know, other venues, have been taking place for mating, for tourism, and so on and so forth. Those things do not lead to a macro-political solution. 
But the idea is to simply ask a question. What are some of those short-term actions and projects which can marginally create a basis or underlying condition for the potential of more positive long-term process and pattern of conflict resolution and transformation? So it is a constant strategic thinking, trying to push the boundary, connecting the short-term with the long-term without any utopian thinking whatsoever, that whatever short-term projects or actions you took will necessarily lead to some kind of long-term consequences. If I could use this eye diagram, so to speak, that connects short-term to long-term to the XY axis, you get the following uh, on the slide. Now you're putting the eye closer to the origin of the Cartesian, Cartesian space and trying to illustrate a strategic thinking of an actor in the middle of functional coexistence, where you take some short-term actions and projects with a view toward possibility of long-term processes and change. But as you do so, you're also in the midst of a tension between formal, informal, individual, and collective. In the Taiwan Strait dialogues that I have been running, I actually show diagrams like this to mainland Chinese people, the Taiwanese people, and American civil society delegates, and ask a simple question. If the cross strait conflict is around here, I'm just using the, moving the cursor here, then what would be one thing you as civil society delegates do to push the boundary outward, knowing that the basic framework, the structure of mutual non-recognition denial remains unchanged in the foreseeable future. But that kind of question and the party's active engagement with the question would enable them to go beyond complete hopelessness, stay in a pragmatic way of thinking, and come up with some concrete actions that they can work on. I am now coming to the end of my presentation and to point out one more implication of my, my, my inquiry on functional coexistence here. That is that in today's world of interconnectedness, where there are so many examples of functional coexistence, a potential cases of functional coexistence because of the enduring conflicts from the Taiwan Strait to Russia, Ukraine, to many other places. I wonder what role man-made intentional effort will make to transform the basis of it. And during my um, years of working with Lebanese and Syrians and uh, the civil war in Syria, I decided to explore the concept of contextual transformation uh, because the big mountains of the conflict of the kind I described don't move so easily. The Syria and Syria was yet another example of that. Contextual transformation is defined as a broad category of macro historical shifts, which are largely independent of intervention efforts man-made intentional efforts, but which can be accelerated by matching intervention efforts. What do I mean by that? I'm showing the image of the mountains. I could have shown the image of ocean. And if you are a surfer, you know very well that as a surfer, you cannot create the big waves. Waves are caused by a geological, natural reasons. But if you as a surfer ex exercises your agency, agency means an ability and, and the will, make decisions and act on the decisions, you can definitely observe how the waves are moving. I can write on the waves. What is the angle and timing in which you're gonna write on the waves? you do have a way to exercise agency 
despite the fact that the macrostructure context of the waves is something beyond the control of a surfer. So I'm using this metaphor to say that there are seismic shifts taking place into this society that can usher in the tidal waves of contextual transformation, which in turn may change the premise of seemingly untransformed conflict. What are the examples of those big tidal waves? They include the internet, digital, and AI revolutions. Revolutions in bioengineering, including gene editing, especially AI revolutions and bioengineering revolutions are combined. We are seeing a massive social transformation, climate-induced disasters and responses, energy transition toward post oil world, where China today is taking a massive lead and the United States and other countries, European Union too, are following suit. New waves and mutations of global pandemics, demographic shifts, meaning the population growth and decline, the aging population, migration, etc., etc. So those are all big things. And conventionally, these, these and other seismic shifts on a global scale are not necessarily seen as particular causes of a specific conflict. But what, what I'm questioning is that if the fundamental basis of functional coexistence could ever shift, it will be the intersection between and among these seismic shifts, which will shift the ground upon which the premise of non-recognition might change overnight, uh, over time. So observing those shifts, naming the character and nature of the shifts should be added to a legitimate means of conflict intervention practice. To wrap up, I want to share a haiku poem, uh, being Japanese myself, a haiku poem I composed one evening in the midst of a struggle facilitating a city and people's workshop. Moving unmovable mountains, one pebble at a time. Redirecting a mighty river, one drop of water at a time. I end with this haiku poem because despite the deep and profound nature of the contextual stability that makes any form of conflict position or transformation difficult, there's always a role of human agency. And I, as a practitioner, always ask myself, am I doing the things that I can do despite the likelihood that the consequences of, of my action may not have any systematic impact at one point or another. But if you take action, even by moving one pebble at a time or taking care of one drop of water at a time, that will still become a cause of inspiration for others to follow. So with that, I end my presentation and thank you so much for your attention. Uh, thanks, thanks to you. It was a great uh, presentation. Now I want to uh, give the word to Dr. Tameshni Dian. Uh, she will talk, uh, uh, sorry, she is a professor in the University of South Africa. And she will talk about the potential role of arts and culture in the reconciliation process in post-conflict uh, Sri Lanka. Uh, so thank you so much for uh, joining uh, the panel. And uh, the word is yours. Uh, for the rest of the public, remember, you can add your questions and comments to the button below in the 
term uh, window and our panelists we will uh, be answered that by the end of the section yes hmm. no thank you thank you um uh, Maurizio. i just wanted to find out if you can see my uh, my uh, presentation on screen uh, we can see it if you could just start the presentation. So with uh, a single slide instead of all the PowerPoints, that yeah. would be great. I'm, yeah, I'm, that's it. Yeah. Uh, can you see that now? Uh, uh, no, you still need to click on the on the option of beginning the slide show. Yeah, that's it. Click on there that. We and, there we go. Yeah, we got Perfect. it. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. No, thank you so much as well. Um, I'm going to start from there. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Professor Tatsuzi. That was a very interesting uh, presentation. I'm not sure why this is not coming um, here. Uh, Maurizio, is there something that I should do to remove this from the top of my screen? Or should I just put it down there? Uh, we are not watching anything. If you refer okay. to the controls, I think you can click on it and just drag it to the side. But we okay. are not okay. uh, watching that. You know, yeah. Mauricio, I, I can see the slide clearly. Perfect. Thank, thank you, Prof. Thank you, Maurizio. Uh, good, good afternoon, good evening, good, uh, good day, um, uh, colleagues and, and friends. Thank you so much for joining me for this presentation today. Um, I was very taken and very uh, engaged by Dr. Tachutsi's uh, presentation, and I hope I can add to the dialogue that he was speaking about in terms of conflict resolution. Uh, my name is Tameshni Dean. I'm from the University of South Africa. I'm an associate professor. I'm an advocate of the High Court of South Africa. And when called upon to do so, I'm sometimes an acting judge in South Africa. Um, my my uh, presentation today is on the potential role of, of arts and culture in a reconciliation process. And I shall be looking at the example of Sri Lanka. Now, the topic that you will see here differs slightly from um, what has been indicated to you on the program, uh, but that's just because I wanted to look at a broader aspect of uh, conflict resolution. Um, I am now trying um, to go to the next slide, Maurizio. I'm not sure what is happening. Uh, me neither. Could there we you go. Try to... Yeah, there you go. Yeah, I've you got it. it. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so yeah, much. Yeah, of course. I'll be here. <laughs> Technology, okay. So what I wanna do is I want to start off with giving an introduction and a background to the topic that I have discussed. I would also like to to um, uh, to mention that I've written a lot about the uh, conflict uh, situation uh, in Sri, uh, Sri Lanka. My latest uh, publication was, um, was, was a few months ago in terms of the uh, continued marginalization and discrimination, uh, taking into account the economic issues that's happening in the country at the moment. So just, for those of us who are just starting off, the introduction is that Sri Lanka was once, it was colonized. And in 1942, they they um, they gained their independence. And um, with that independence, they had a relative peaceful transfer of power from its colonial rules. Now, with this independence, it brought with it immense hope uh, for prosperity. Uh, because it was it was seen as a an, an, a very crucial and very um, um, significant time in Sri Lanka's in history. However, what um, what did happen is with the independence uh, came a a new set of issues uh, in terms of uh, the conflict in terms of uh, finding peace in the country. Um, what followed was an ethnic conflict that was considered one of the world's most violent and protracted secessionist movements since the end of the Second World War. Now, this is very, very important because uh, it, it gives you the context about these uh, about the uh, severity of the violations that happened in the country uh, after the uh, after independence. Now, this armed conflict in Sri Lanka emerged against the backdrop of a deepening discrimination and marginalization of the country's minorities, particularly the Tamils by the majority Sinhalese. Uh, the focus here was on the Tamils uh, specifically, and not because there was, uh, uh, the other minorities did not suffer during the war and consequently after the war, but the war was specifically and most importantly based on this, uh, on the discrimination against uh, the, the, Tam the Tamilians. Now, the war lasted for almost 30 years between the government 
and the liberation Tamil Tigers of Elam. And what happened was there when I said the seriousness of this, like any conflict situation, this conflict was marked by persistent and grave human rights violations and abuses uh, by both parties, including extrajudicial killings. We had widespread and forced disappearances, arbitrary detention, torture, and sexual violence affecting Sri Lankans, as I mentioned, not only from the Tamil community, from the majority, uh, from the uh, from all communities. Now, um, although the LTT were defeated in 2009, that's almost 13 years ago, the underlying ethnic divides which propelled the rebel movement um, is, has, has uh, been, is far from being resolved. So what is the current situation? Currently, Sri Lanka finds itself trying to promote reconciliation and relationship building. That's exactly what Professor Tatsusi was speaking about, about relationship building amongst all communities in, in, in the country. Uh, this is not only uh, significant for Sri Lanka, but this is significant for most communities that have experienced post-conflict issues. Uh, the thing is that in Sri Lanka specifically, the post-conflict successive leaderships they have attempted to achieve peace building through the establishment of numerous commissions of inquiries and tribunals. However, despite this, to date, none of them have attended any concrete results. In fact, in March 2022, the international community once again raised uh, concerns that Sri Lanka's lack of accountability for past crimes has heightened the risk of human rights violations being repeated. It further highlighted the concerning trend of deepening impunity, increasing marginalization of government, governmental functions, ethno-nationalistic rhetoric, and intimidation of civil society by the mostly majority Sinhalese community. Now, this becomes important, this current situation and its history becomes important simply because in 2022, Sri Lanka saw an unprecedented economic collapse, which was attributed actually to the years of impunity, uh, impunity for these human rights uh, violations. It was the first time in the history of the ethnic, uh, ethnic war that the international community uh, related the economic collapse to the impunity uh, regarding the uh, human rights violations uh, in Sri Lanka. So therefore it becomes more important uh, for uh, and more crucial for Sri Lanka to heal divisions and to create new and to create new opportunities for recon reconciliation whilst addressing the root causes of mistrust and, and hostility. So the purpose of this paper presentation basically is to evaluate, seeing that the other initiatives, the traditional initiatives of in rebuilding infrastructure, uh, um, development of uh, uh, commu commissions of inquiries, et cetera, is not achieving the required uh, outcome. I wanted to, uh, to evaluate the potential role of art and cultural work as a tool to contribute to peace building and the reconciliation process in post-conflict Sri, Sri Lanka. So this, my, my talk is just going to examine the academic evidence for the role that art and culture can play as part of a spectrum of interventions linking culture, peace building and reconciliation. Now you might wonder why focus on the arts and culture? Uh, why not something different and but and and how effective would uh, arts and culture be in a reconciliation and peace building process? Uh, I'll be answering that uh, one one question at a time. But by looking at the potential role of arts and culture in reconciliation, it will be shown that for the environment for the achievement of sustainable peace, and that's what we're all looking for after post conflict, is sustainable peace. We don't want to uh, put plasters on 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 stuff that is. Uh, that has been and not been healed because it will never uh, heal without substantive efforts. So I want to look at how to achieve how the arts and culture will uh, will help in achieving sustainable peace by looking at the cultural component to peace building, and also uh, it's and it's, and to show that this is as important as the other efforts as post as at post building uh, post conflict peace building and reconciliation. As I said, we are looking at this as part of a spectrum of efforts. Uh, so what I'm going to look at is I'm going to highlight some responses some attitudes and behaviors in relation to the conflict and how this can be transformed through art and uh, culture and how the introduction of strategic based uh, um, programs, strategic arts based program with local content can firstly have a significant impact 
on breaking barriers and stereotypes, uh, how it can recognize and tolerate different identities, and it, how it can actually acknowledge the loss and suffering, thereby strengthening the community as a whole. Now, my argument for the case of arts and culture in, 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 uh, in uh, uh, reconciliation is very simple. 2009, the war ended. It is now 2013. There is a deepening divide in Sri Lanka. It's deepening discrimination. Uh, minorities are still subject to, uh, to violence. Uh, militarization in Sri Lanka it has continued beyond uh, promises of stopping, etc. And then the major challenge remains to build peace and harmony in the society. So therefore, I, I believe that the government cannot only look at rebuilding lost infrastructure or improving the economy alone, or providing for what I believe has so far been superficial mechanisms that does not achieve its intended uh, mandates. What we need to look at uh, is, and I think this is what uh, Dr. Tatushi is also involved in, is about healing divisions and broken relationships. Now, until such time as the traditional means alone, like the implementation of the commissions of, um, of inquiries can successively, successfully be used towards the peace building process, other non-traditional methods must be explored. I have reviewed a lot of uh, literature around uh, this, this topic, and I found that arts has a particular ability to engage people in a way that resonates with their local society. It can also create a context sensitive approach to the reconciliation rather than merely attempting social restoration based on idealistic principles. Such idealization has not currently worked for the country. So what is needed then is what we are looking at is community-based activities that can promote dialogue and respect for differences. Uh, clearly, that has not worked in our current situation. Uh, that is the respect for differences and to promote dialogue. I think uh, Professor Tachusi also um, mentioned uh, of opening dialogues, which is an important aspect of conflict resolutions and reconciliations. And then uh, artists and cultural workers are making an impact in many uh, conflict regions throughout the world. However, there has been little recognition for their work among policymakers and peace building practitioners. Now, uh, this paper, uh, it's going to be, even though far from exhaustive, I'm going to uh, document a few illustrative examples from other conflict countries of what has been accomplished by arts and culture in reconciliation. The examples are going to show me firstly, or show us firstly, how practitioners and communities are using arts and the cultural programs in both indigenous and multifaceted ways. And it's going to show how artists, practitioners, and institutions are harnessing the transformative potential of the arts and cultural interventions to engage communities in post-conflict settings, to build relationships, create safe spaces, to catalyze dialogue and to support healing and reconciliation. The first example that I'm actually going to look at about what arts and culture can do is related to the issue of breaking language and other barriers. Now, in the aftermath of violence, and this and loss, in the aftermath of, math of violence and loss in any conflict situation, individuals emerge traumatized and they are unable to verbalize and make sense of the um, uh, many emotions that they experience. Now, um, a scholar has argued that for survivors coming out of situations of gross human rights violations, firstly, there is no language that is able to convey the trauma, the trauma that they feel. And secondly, because language gains its meaning through family and community, and since violence destroys the very social fabric of life, everyday verbal language is inadequate to relay the extent of trauma and the depth of emotions that survivors experience. Now, the benefits for reconciliation of working with culture and arts is that, that, that they allow the people who have experienced severe trauma to become aware of and communicate in ways that are considered to be less threatening and, than ordinary speech. Now, in, in Sri Lanka, for example, the intolerance towards the Tam Tamil language and culture was a major contributor to the civil war. Now, the uh, literature has shown that arts can actually transcend language and allow for nonverbal communication. Uh, in peace building uh, initiatives, the arts can actually embody reciprocity to encourage connectivity and mutual understanding, 
and it can be used to facilitate engagement in a non-coercive manner, allowing conflicting communities to address their differences. Uh, in in other conflicts around the uh, other conflict regions around the world, excluding Sri Lanka, I'm going to look at Co Colombia, Syria, and Rwanda. Research has shown as demonstrated how arts and cultural programs can be adapted to the local context and used to engage communities in their own cultural languages. Uh, the the research has highlighted the strength of arts and cultural programs in giving dignity to the oppressed, because what does conflict does? It takes away a person's humaneness, their dignity, and art and culture can give this back uh, to the oppressed and exploited communities, and it can enable cross-cultural communication. The use of metaphor and of visual material enables engagement while creating enough distance to prevent re-traumatization. Um, in this way, artistic interventions have the potential to fill a gap which everyday language can, cannot. And that is to portray the extent of trauma and the depth of emotions that survivors actually experience. The second uh, example is breaking of stereotypes. Now the arts also presents an opportunity for conflicting parties to meet in a neutral and positive and creative context. Uh, it can break down stereotypes and the barriers of mistrust between adversarial communities, paving the way for reconciliation. For example, uh, in, in Sri Lanka, the Tamils associate the Tamils associate the Sinhalese with oppressive um, with an oppressive state and a brutal military apparatus. Um, if if you want more information on this, I've, I've as I've mentioned, I've, I've wrote a lot of uh, articles on the brutal nature of the militarization and the uh, discrimination and human rights violations that has occurred in Sri Lanka. Um, it will be on my Google Scholar profile as well for you to have, because this seems a little bit uh, superficial at the moment if you do not have a base, a, a, a substantive understanding of the types of the violations that occurred in Sri Lanka at the time. So, for as I mentioned, the Tamils associate the Sinhalese with an oppressive state and a brutal military apparatus. The Sinhalese, by contrast, see the Tamils as a disruptive and dangerous terrorist group. These antagonistic attitudes become insinuated into the day-to-day -day ways in which people articulate their views and interact with others. The resulting stereotypes act to continually, continuously fuel conflict and dehumanize the enemy. So whilst breaking down stereotypes and deep-seated antagonisms will be a long and arduous process, as doctor, as our my previous presenter has said, it is one, uh, you want to move a mountain one brick at a time, you want to uh, move a, 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 the seeds one drop at a time. It is that it is going to be an arduous process. It starts with acknowledging the deep hurts of a society ravaged by ethnic conflict. Um, with, with their approach, uh, I'm gonna give you an example. So with, the, with their approach to understanding of peace and relational processes through which that understanding is developed. The Sri Lankan theater group, Theater of the People, People provides a prime example of how to successfully break down stereotypes. The Theater of the People is a multi-ethnic and multi-religious theater group, which was established in 2004 and has been touring the island with the objective of promoting mutual understanding, tolerance, and trust within and among the communities. Living and working together as a multi-ethnic group, their notion of peace is largely based on coexistence and collaboration. Their performances and experiences show that it is very possible to showcase personal experiences with conflict, which are then transformed into narratives that are less vengeful and more accepting of others. Their experience has also highlighted the importance of placing local actors at the heart of programs from design to implementation stage. Another way of helping the arts and culture can help is that it can help communities to grieve. Now it creates, the arts and culture creates a unique medium to express the pain of loss and war, share the burden and potentially begin to heal from it. For example, dance has been cited as a reconciliation activity in the Democratic Republic, Republic of Congo, and it serves to create a sense of shared rather than individual suffering. At their best, these efforts can address the loss of dignity along with feelings of fears, mourning and mistrust that people experience. At the same time, they show the need to seek justice, the hope for a shared future and efforts aimed at breaking down stereotypes. 
Same thing. Uh, yeah, I was wondering if it was it, uh, it, Dr. Tamishni, but yes, yeah, I, I think, think she phrased. Yeah. Hmm. I think you may want hmm. to communicate with yeah. her. Let's okay. wait a moment to see if she can uh, reconnect. Right. And we are uh, 10 minutes away to the end of our panel. So hopefully she can give us a closure to her presentation. Uh, please uh, let wait a moment. Yeah. Thank you for your patience. Yeah. You Probably can suspend the got, yeah. yeah. You can yeah. suspend the recording for uh, until she comes back. Yeah. Totally. You don't, <laughs> you don't have to end, but suspend it. Oh no! I I need to end the session in about ten minutes. So actually, if any of you want to uh, make a question. Uh, in general, or specifically for Dr. Tatsushi. Yeah, she's back. Uh, yeah. She's back. okay. I'm sorry, I am back. I am not sure what happened. Um, I'm going to try and share my screen again. Sorry, Maritio. Can you see me again now? Yes, we can see you again. We were telling uh, we need to close the session in 10 minutes. So, uh, yeah, please, please conclude. And if we got some min minutes for a comment, it's okay. Uh, but yeah, please conclude your presentation. Yeah. Perfect. I'll do that, Maritza. Thank you so much. So what thank I'm going to do is, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm, I was going to give you examples of the drummers in uh, in Rwanda, and then uh, we've also uh, we've also shown research has also shown that it has been a cathartic expression of painful feelings for the individual drummer, uh, and uh, an instrument in it's an instrument of healing. It also acts to reaffirm identities as a vehicle for a culture, as it can shape perceptions against the us and them. Uh, the, the unique power of the aesthetic forms of expression can help to challenge fixated destructive powers, patterns of behavior. Once again, in my research, I looked at Rwanda's efforts to build a new relationship and shared national identity. I've also looked at Syria, and uh, several projects uh, that they use like theater, dance, and musicals that have been used to foster different communities and help build a stronger sense of belonging. Um, and then uh, in my research, I've also found that uh, there's been various best practices that have, um, uh, with the integration of art in many recovery efforts, best practices have emerged. I've looked at how during Colombia's uh, a difficult transition to peace and decades of uh, internal conflict. Reports show how that uh, uh, during genocide, uh, national reconciliation efforts that included film, music, crafts, architecture, and theater helped in the reconciliation efforts. There was also a research that was conducted by the University of West Scotland that um, also looked at the devastating impact of the violence and how that, as how the film arts and culture helped in fostering understanding through cultural exchange in arts. And um, uh, in another study, it was found how music and the arts can delve into the pain of the conflict, but that participants must need to internalize and consider how they can bring those healing back to the uh, back to the communities. I've also looked at how in Syria, um, the arts therapy and theater initiatives with street children have been used to help pro the process of trauma and conflict building. Specifically in South Africa, the Institute for Justice and Reconciliation's um, projects uh, looked at how we can use uh, use change the narrative to dim to dem de democratizing the narrative after centuries of colonialism and apartheid. This and how we use the um, the uh, the, uh, the production of the fall, which looked at the hashtag Peace Must Fall, uh, helped in uh, bringing uh, some form of peace and um, uh, peace in in post uh, apartheid South Africa. I also said, even though what a, a cautionary tale is that even though the arts and culture can be used for good, it must be noted that whilst arts can provide a creative pathway to reconciliation, at times it has been used to undermine security and stability 
and pursue violent nationalist and other agendas. And in this way, you looked at the uh, how uh, arts was used by Nazi Germany, where creative posters were distributed and they changed the narrative to suit the dialogue or the uh, uh, the um, the political situation at the at, at that time. So the transformative power of the arts lies in artistic creativity. So you do not use it for um, a political agenda or propaganda. Now in here, you will see that I'm coming to my conclusion and I've, I've gone, come up with the various recommendations that there must be an acknowledgement of arms um, uh, that, that has happened. The arts-based peace building initiatives can actually help create an identity. I've shown you some of the various uh, various uh, um, uh, um, examples. And I'm going to just go, what I'm going to do because we are pressed for time, I'm going to just show you the, uh, the way you can find an article in terms of where you can uh, look at a more detailed discussion of my presentation here today. Thank you very, very much. Uh, thank you, thank you so much. Uh, that was a wonderful uh, presentation. So we have a couple of minutes. Uh, if any of you want to make a question or comment to our speakers, or if any of uh, our presenters wants to add some final notes on each other. So yeah, please, the, the space is all yours. Yeah. Mm -hmm. If uh, there's no nobody who wants to ask a question at this very moment, but I just want to prioritize the audience to make comments or raise questions. Okay. So Tanishine, I think with your permission, I just want to add to the presentation you made. Yes, Perfect. yes, I have worked in Sri Lanka, uh, especially for the uh, Shinhali Tamils, but also Buddhist Muslim relations interfaith dialogue. And, um, but I think what, what I want to mention is actually that in my own composition practice as well, I use art, theater, uh, rituals extensively. So just to reinforce the importance of what you presented, I will just present only one example, picture. That is uh, the Taiwan-China-US dialogue that I have been doing for some time. And the ritual we use is something called walk through history. And that is that if we have participants in a dialogue from Taiwan, uh, mainland China, United States, we ask each one of the three teams what will be uh, eight to 10 of the most important historical events that shape your view of the conflict across the Taiwan Strait. And they each come up with a timeline. So they come up with three different timelines and you see on the floor three timelines lined up. They actually literally ritualistically walk through the space between the timelines. And an example of this would be something like this. In 2005, I'm just highlighting only the Taiwanese and mainland Chinese timelines. The mainland Chinese delegation indicated 221 BC, the ancient Chinese dynasty unifying China. That is the first event to be highlighted. And then 1945, the end of uh, the, the, the Second World War and so on and so forth. And you notice that the Taiwanese side started with a completely different image. And I think I don't get into details, but if you actually do an intellectual presentation and do a back and forth, you don't go very deep. But if you actually walk through in silence, reflect, and then contemplate, we go to a very deep place of dialogue. So I just wanted to reinforce the theme of art, a peace building reconciliation. 
uh, supported my own experiences. And I have also a series of publications as well as practitioner initiatives along these lines. Just want to thank you, uh, Kanishini's presentation. Thank you so much, Professor. Thank you for that. Amazing. Thank you so much for the feedback. Thank you both of you for your presentation. And I think this is a great way to close our panel. Uh, please follow us for the uh, rest of the conference uh, and enjoy the, the rest of the activities. Yeah. See you around you, in the WOBA platform. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you, everyone. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you, Maricia. Thank you. Yes. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye.